Welcome to Team Perry's Step Out of Line podcast, featuring co-hosts Perry and Lori Finkelstein. Together, they explore, meet, and share inspirational stories with guests who have made a positive impact in today's world. This podcast resonates with our hope to make this world a better place one step at a time through love, acceptance, and uplifting conversations. my first romantic comedy and it's been really a joy to publish it and to connect with readers like you. There have been, I would say, many times when I have stepped out of line. I moved to New York when I was 29 and I didn't have a visa, a job, uh, I didn't have a place to stay, I didn't know anyone in the city Uh, and if you're thinking you didn't have a plan. You are correct. I had very little organized, but I had this sense that my life in Sydney was, it hadn't yet come into fruition. And I had that feeling all throughout my twenties, but sort of just felt like, well, eventually things are going to kind of click into place and I'm just going to feel like I'm where I'm meant to be. And by the time I reached my late twenties, I had not had that feeling. It had not felt like it had happened for me. And Sydney is my hometown. It's a beautiful place. It's obviously, it's a a, a absolutely gorgeous city. But like all hometowns, when you grow up there and spend all of your time there, you need to spread your wings. It, It does start to feel a little stifling. And the move to New York was not one that a lot of Australians make. Certainly Australians would travel and and visit, but it's not uh, super common to relocate your life to the opposite side of the planet with very little sort of (laughs) in your metaphorical suitcase uh, and to basically start again, you know, uh, sort of reset in terms of making friends, working out how the city is, um, just, you know, I didn't, realize I would have to get a social security card or open a bank account or any of those many things that go into piecing a life together. But I was in love with New York City. I had come on a a short trip with my then roommate um, who I'd sort of modeled a character on in one of my earlier novels, The Regulars, a very fun, outrageous girl who uh, was the sort of curator of this amazing trip. And I fell head over heels in love with the city. And even though it would moving here would kind of put me far away from my friends and family and everything that I knew uh, at all of my, you know, comfort zone, I had to do it. And so I moved and was also sort of thought that my, my credentials would translate well and that I would be able to find work easily. I had been working as a writer. I'd had one very small young adult novel published uh, in Australia, but I'd worked as a magazine editor. I'd been working in publishing for a while. Like I'd been pitching articles and kind of stitching my life together and, and just sort of assumed that, oh, well, when I moved to New York, like that would be easy enough to sort of do the same thing there, you know, and it was not, um, Fun fact, your credentials will not carry from Australia to America. You are basically back at the bottom rung. I was applying for jobs and then I was applying for like the assistant to that position, then the assistant's intern to that position and and getting nothing. I was very broke and living on in like the cheapest place I could find, living on boxed wine and I never got a cab. I never went out. I didn't I, I, like... You know, I would start to make friends and get invited out to group dinners and couldn't go to those because, you know, when the bill comes around at the end of the night, there was no way that I could like cover my end of the tab. But I really wanted to be a novelist and to write. And that was one thing that is free to do. And so I was working very hard on writing one book that didn't sell but then I got an agent out of it. And then I wrote one book that did sell for a very, very small amount of money. And then I, uh, by that stage, I was in my early 30s and had this strong sense of I have to make a living, like I have to kind of make this work. Otherwise, who am I kidding, you know? And I changed my tack for The Regulars, which was my first novel with Simon & Schuster. Actually, I have it here. It was It's this cover. And I hired a developmental editor 
um, which I hadn't done before, which is when you pay an editor to uh, do a round of notes and feedback with you separate from what you would get from, you know, should the book be acquired, extra work on your end. By then I was, I had landed a, a, a full-time sort of contract, contract luckily, and was going to a writer's space after work every night to work on the book and every weekend. And I was reading much more widely in the genre and I just sort of went in in a different way. I really did positively visualize selling the book to one of the big five, which is how we refer to the, the big publishing companies um, and it being a success. And I sort of doggedly pursued that goal up um, through to selling the novel and uh, and luckily for me and for everyone in my life, I achieved that goal, which sort of set me onto a different path. I suppose the other thing that comes to mind is living as a queer person. Uh, I, I I was very lucky in that I had a very um, nonchalant family. <laughs> like they did not really care. Uh, I came out when I was 19 after discovering my sexuality at university, which is where I feel like a lot of discoveries are made and uh, connecting with the queer community. I was a student activist. I was really involved with a lot of progressive causes. I became a vegetarian and it is a way of sort of stepping outside of, you know, what is expected of you and the sort of traditional path that is carved um, and the ways in which you date and and even when you are dating someone um you know I'm I'm married now um uh, and and what I find really thrilling about you know our experience and our courtship and our relationship is it doesn't tend to sort of be defined by such strict roles of like this is what you know this is what the man always picks up the check <laughs> lady always you know spends her time getting her hair right for the date or I didn't I don't know how straight people operate but um it's sort of you get to define your own path, like living as a queer person because you're not sort of following these behavioural stereotypes. Um, and that is also what I find really enlivening about um, about my life and, and about the experience I'm in. So I suppose there are two of the first things that come to mind when you say stepping out of line. That's beautiful. I was reading somewhere, I think maybe it was this most recent book, um, you wrote it completely and then you met with an editor and you redid everything. You went back to square one. To me, that's probably the bravest thing out of everything that you've done, even though the two big step out of lines you, you described are extremely brave. But to have the stamina to go through that again and rewrite your work and, and take, you know, the words, obviously, that meant so much to you on a page and redo the whole thing, an entire book. It reminds me a lot of Perry when she has, let's say, a different response than she wants for a paper she's writing for school and has to start back all over. And I would have given up like ages ago and she just keeps plugging away until she gets it right. I think it takes a certain kind of person to have to do that and to get through it. Well, obviously Perry and I share resilience as a trait and I uh, would definitely think of myself as a very resilient person. So um, what you're referring to, I believe with this book was, I had written a 25,000 word submission, which is about a quarter of the book. And that's what my agent and I had sold it to my editor off. And after we sold it, which took about a year to do, and I had worked with, a, again, I have a developmental editor that I still work with on every book, and we had gone through a round of edits, so it was very polished and, and you know, it was a, a solid chunk of writing. That's probably 50 pages or something like that. And uh, I was having a drink with my agent after we sold it, and we had sold it for less money than we were hoping for to be perfectly frank. And I had said to my agent, I had the feeling that she didn't love it, you know, and we had actually just started working together. So we're sort of still just filling each other out. And I said to her, just be honest with me. Like, do you like this book? Do you think it will sell? And she said, no. And that's why you have an agent, you know, you want their honest opinion. Right. And she felt that the sample that we had sold that my editor had already bought was, it was, not the book that it is now. It wasn't a romantic comedy. It was more like a dark comedy. It was much, my agent's term was spiky, like uh, the character of Liv, who was quite different in this sample, was just 
a more damaged character. I mean, she had been through a lot, you know, the setup of this book is a woman realizes that her husband has been having an affair when he dies and leaves his half of a wedding planning business to his younger blonder girlfriend, Savannah Shipley, forcing the two women to work together to revive this now failing wedding planning business in order to save their livelihoods and reputation. And this is like, there is definitely a take on that character where she is extremely damaged and, and, and bitter over that experience. Um, and I thought it was funny, <laughs> but my agent did not agree. And she said, I think there's a real warmth to this idea. You know, I think you can really lean into the, 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 the heart of this story and focus more on the romance. And I hadn't written a rom-com before, but I really wanted to write a successful book. And my first two books, The Regulars and The Bucket List, that I had done with Simon and Schuster, they did fine, but they weren't changing the world. They had, had modest sales. Uh, and I, you know, I want to write a book that a million people read. <laughs> like, I, you know, that's what everyone, that's whatever a writer wants. You know, you want to connect with the most people possible. Right. Uh, well, that, 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 that's what I want. And so I, I you know, I, I definitely did not need to do that rewrite because we'd already sold the book. I could have said, thanks for the feedback. You know, I'm just going to push on with what I've got. But you, as a writer, it's very important that you have a at least one North Star that you look to for feedback and advice. And if you, and that person is often your agent, um, that is a person that you should trust above and beyond, you know, your best friend and, or, or even your partner, like everyone has an idea of what they think will sell, but even in the industry, no one knows. But I felt that instinctively, she instinctually, I felt that she was right. And even though it would be a lot of work to throw out a year's worth of work and start again, um, that that would be the right thing to do. And it was not the first time that I did that. I, um, the first book that I wrote after the regulars was a historical fiction novel called Girls with Pep. I wasn't under contract, but I felt strongly that it would be a good follow-up to the regulars. It was uh, set in 1920s LA. It was similarly about the like the love lives of women in the mid-20s. And it was set in like Hollywood. It was a very, you know, the 1920s Hollywood, a very fun, permissive, sexy time. And uh, my editor knew the concept. My old agent, who has since left the business, we're still good friends, she loved it. You know, it was a lot of good energy swirling around the project. That took me a year and a half to write, including self-funded trips to California to go to sort of be able to see shooting scripts um, from silent movies. And I read extremely widely. I basically became an expert in silent cinema. It was all historically accurate. And my editor ended up passing on the book. She read it. She didn't like it. She didn't want to buy it. She wanted, there was a brief talk of changing it to being set in the present day, which would have made it a completely different book because it was very much about the, you know, the, the time. I kind of had to, obviously I could have just, then my publishing career could have just been like overall taken a major break. Um, but she, my editor sort of said, well, if you want to come in and pitch me some other ideas, you can do that. And what I wanted to do was drink a bucket of wine and crawl <laughs> into bed for a year because it had taken me a year and a half to write that book. It was a complete manuscript, again, had gone through multiple edits and um, that I also loved and felt very close to and, and really close to all of the characters. But if I wanted to stay on a publishing track and stay with Simon and & Schuster and sort of I had to just roll with those extremely hard punches. That was like on a Friday and on the Monday presenting two new ideas that I worked on over the weekend and we never spoke about that book ever again. And that was that was even harder <laughs> than what I did with this. And And when you, I think the thing about failure is, and I've also written another book that didn't sell. So like, and the first time it happens or the idea of it happening is like, oh, I would never recover from that. Definitely always thought before it happened, oh, if I wrote a book and didn't sell, I mean, I would give up public. Like I would never do it again. I would never be able to get past that. And then it happens and you do. And it's not as bad as you think it is. And life goes on and everyone else's life goes on, you know, and the only person that you'll really be punishing if that happens is yourself, you know, like, um, that's the sort of difficult thing about being a creative um, 
even if you have a, a lot of people interested in responding to your work, listening, watching, reading, whatever your format is, if you don't do it, no one really cares. There's a million other people who are doing wonderful things and putting wonderful things out there and working really hard. As any person, you have to develop an extremely resilient backbone to right. get through the inevitable rejections that will pile up on your plate. And I have friends who are not professional writers, not really wanting to be professional writers, but, you know, everyone has a dream of writing a novel and they take setbacks like an editor rejecting their work, you know, so badly. And it's like, oh, honey, like I have, I've been through, I've written multiple pilots that didn't sell. I've done workshops that no one came to. I have uh, just, you know, I've had many, many things fall apart and, you do just get better at rolling through them and it always hurts and is upsetting, but it's sort of the only way forward. You can't have a big ego at all because you have to be able to just take it and then just roll with the punches, like you said, and just, you know, keep going. Do you binge on any television shows or like, what's your favorite thing to watch? Uh, right now, I just started watching the new season of Younger, which I really like a lot. Oh. Um, that's a really fun show. It's set in the publishing industry, which it's a very, <laughs> very televised version of the publishing industry. Um, and uh, but it's still like a lot of fun if you have like, you know, even if you're obviously if you're not in publishing, it's a, uh, you know, fast paced, sexy, fun show. So I love um, watching Younger. There's a great show. Um, that I'm really into called Feel Good, which is a comedy, a dark comedy uh, drama, but focus on the comedy created by a comedian who is Canadian living in London called Mae Martin, who is non-binary. And it's a very extremely smart, sexy, um, semi-autobiographical show based on their life and uh, dating history as someone who is a former addict and um, in a relationship with a woman who's never dated women before. That I recommend that show to everyone. Uh, I recently discovered The Great British Bake Off uh, and I've watched every single episode of that show. Cannot get enough of um, Mary and Paul and Soggy Bottoms and all of the delightful uh, Britishisms and the I just love the feel good nature of that show like I'm sort of addicted to that feel good feeling like the feeling that had you crying at the end of the book Perry okay. love that um, beautiful warm uh, just we're all just trying our best kind of vibe so uh, super into that and um, and some friends of mine just made a show called Cruel Summer which is on a uh, free form on Hulu, which is like a sort of a, a, a bit of a, a dark sudsy teen drama, uh, like a twisty plot, um, which I'm, I started watching because my friends made it and then really got into it. And now I'm like, Oh my God, I have to watch the finale. We've been binge watching. Um, I think during quarantine, we might've watched Mrs. Maisel two or three times. Oh yeah. I'm and then so Shit's Creek every, you know, every time oh. we need a, need a fix, we're watching that yeah, again. Me too. Yeah. Right. And then friends, sometimes you just need something that you're familiar with just because you feel like, okay, I could do this. And then occasionally we'll venture out and branch out into something a little crazier. Um, you know, it depends what mood we're in, but we, we've been like watching obviously so much over the past year, you know, in between uh, her schoolwork and, and, and watching TV that leaves little time for else. But um, now that summertime, Perry's able to read books and which is why she picked up yours right away. When did you realize you wanted to become a writer? How old were you? Well, I never really decided to become a writer. I just always wrote. I wrote from a really young age uh, when everyone else was, you know, handing in like a half page story. I was a kid that had the 10 page story and, and was always, uh, I wanted to be a filmmaker when I was younger and I went to school for filmmaking and screenwriting and was still sort of, you know, always just doing lots of, I made zines, like handmade magazines and was always writing and uh, sort of doing projects. And then it kind of moved from filmmaker into more screenwriter. I developed, was always developing like a TV show of some kind. Uh, and it, I did, I had the opportunity to write and my first young adult novel in my late twenties, I was working for, I worked 
for many magazines, but one magazine that I worked for often was called Girlfriend Magazine, which is like Seventeen Magazine, like a, a teen girl magazine. Uh, and they were releasing a line of standalone young adult fiction. So all the books were different. It wasn't like a series with the same characters in every book. It was, they're all different. And they were putting out like 20 girlfriend branded books with um, a major publisher and looking for writers to pitch on, on, the, on, on plot ideas. And because I was kind of part of the girlfriend family, they asked me if I wanted to pitch and I'd never done anything like that before, but I was always happy to do something like I was always making a short film or whatever and I was like sure I'll put a pitch together and just did it in a weekend like I didn't really think about it too much and and then they said okay where well, you can do this and and off you go and I was like what <laughs> I've never written a book before I actually don't know how to do it and I uh I had four months they gave me which at the looking back on it that is insane like that is a really short turnaround no one would ever give you four months I don't think now um, but at the time I was like, okay, four months, that's kind of it. And then I went to Europe. I already had a trip planned. I was going to Europe for a month and I was like, I'll work on the book when I'm in Europe. Of course I did not work on the book right. when I was in Europe. I just got drunk in Paris and then got back and was like, okay, now I've got three months to do this book and a bit of a meltdown and just figured out how many words I needed to write a day to get to 50,000 words, which is, you know, 50,000 is it's a, a shorter book. The book's now like double that length and just made myself do it um I didn't the book now I'm you know I'm still I feel very fond about that book it is a very simple story and it was relatively easy to write once I did it but I didn't really know what I was doing and it's that book's not going to win any awards you know and after I did it I uh didn't really think I was going to do it again I thought I was going to try and get back into screen but when I moved to New York City I Firstly, I was broke, but secondly, I just kind of feel, felt like everyone around me is trying to break into screenwriting, and I know it's even more prevalent in L.A., and maybe I should just write another novel because, you know, I want to be a storyteller. At the end of the day, that's what I want. I want to get the stories in my head onto the page and for people to, like, you know, read them or see them, and that maybe the two wouldn't be so different. And because I'd already written a book I had the door edged open you know and uh so that's kind of how I became a novelist and sometimes that's what happens I think is that we have our like eyes set on a goal without sort of seeing well what other ways could I get to that same goal without you know this path that I've defined for myself and I'm glad that I rerouted because in so many ways it's just you know suits me a lot more to do it this way I can like as if I became a filmmaker which is still like a dream of mine I would still love to to be a screenwriter for television and and when we sell the film rights for this I'll be attached um it's it's just sort of like another another way into it that I can do from anywhere I don't have to worry about budgets I don't have to worry about like when I was making short films like you have to talk everyone into like doing you favors you've got to find like all of these different roles and and as a writer like you're the costumer you're the you're the talent you're the director you know you're the dp you kind of fill all the roles to, in creating this story in people's minds and it's really fun and i feel now as i have i've written my next novel and i'm just about to start the next one because you know by the time a book comes out it's been in production for you know it's been out of your hands for a, a year if not more so most writers have already started working on the next project it's so great that you have such a wider audience now because of fab fit and fun and and being the you know keynote author on on that that's really that must have been so exciting for you to get that phone call oh, thing yeah so exciting and it was one of the first things that we sort of got which was like really exciting for the whole team because it kind of indicates like oh like this book I think is going to find a wider audience and working with them has been amazing I've never I mean I've never done something like this before but I was like so pleasantly surprised by the engagement in, of the community like people really get into it and they're posting all of their like theories and thoughts and you know feelings and I love it. 